Coming up on Mac Break Weekly, I, Micah Sargent, am subbing in for Leo Laporte today. He'll be back, don't you worry. But uh, I get to join Alex Lindsay, Renee Ritchie, and Andy Anatko to talk about all things Apple. We kick off the show with a bit of uh, FUD busting. We talk about that 13-inch MacBook Pro with the M2 chip. How does it compare to the predecessor? Is it actually slower? Then we look at how the U.S. Senate is looking to have the FTC investigate Apple and Google over mobile tracking before we get into more of a conversation about tracking in general and data protection here in the US and elsewhere. Uh, then we hit the rumor circuit with the new Apple Watch, uh, potential new HomePod, and a potential new Apple TV as well. Before we round things out, of course, with the picks of the week. And uh, that includes a Chihuahua made of Legos. Stay tuned, we've got a great show for you podcasts you love from people you trust this is twit this is mac break weekly episode 824 recorded tuesday june 28th 2022 two-headed chihuahua this episode of Mac Break weekly is brought to you by nomad go to nomadgoods.com slash mac break and use the promo code MACBREAK for 10% off your first purchase of any Nomad accessory. Apple watch straps, wireless chargers, ultra-durable cables, and more. Now, that's a limited time offer, though, so hurry! And by Peloton. Right now is the perfect time to try out Peloton. The Peloton Bike Plus is now $500 less, its best price ever, including free delivery and setup. And there are more game-changing prices available on the original Peloton bike and Peloton tread. Visit OnePeloton.com to learn more. And by the new and recently updated TriCaster 2 Elite by NewTek, the most complete live production system on the planet. There's a TriCaster for every production, including yours. Visit go.newtech.com slash twit dash TV, where an interactive guide will advise you on which TriCaster is right for you. It's time for Mac Break Weekly. I am in this week. I, Micah Sargent, am in this week for Leo Laporte as he is out. Um, depending on who you ask, he's in Rhode Island drinking uh, coffee milks or scouring the plains of some faraway tundra for 6G connectivity. Uh, in any case, he is not here with you today. I will be subbing in, but don't worry. We've got a great show planned for you today. And uh, let's kick things off with WGBH's own Andy Anatko. Hello. Andy. Hello, Micah. As always, great to have you hosting as an alternative. Well, I am uh, glad to be here and glad that there is no alternative to you, <laughs> that you, you are, are here with us you are, today. You are, you are the winter garden of, uh, of, 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 of Twit hosts. You are the, alt you are, you are the alt, alt host. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, joining us from the tundras of Canada. Sure, we'll go with that. It's uh, YouTube.com slash Renee Ritchie's Renee Ritchie. Hi, Renee. Uh, Micah, I went to Anaheim for VidCon. It was 91 degrees. I came back to Montreal. It was 91 degrees. I don't know if it clung to me, my low pressure system that was just existing with me, but uh, it, the tundra is all melted away. I'm not complaining, wow. but that's the way it is. 91. 91 yes. where you are. That's that's kind of uh, I think shocking. you guys left the, the front, the porch to Arizona open by accident. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> that's what it was. That's what it was. You uh, folks who regularly watch shows the, uh, of which I'm a part will notice that there's a nice bright red line running down my nose. That's because I, for only the second time in my life, got a sunburn. Uh, usually oh, my no. skin is very good about <laughs> absorbing sunlight. It didn't do such a great job over this uh, past weekend. So um, I, it was very hot here in uh, the North Bay as well. And uh, the sun was out and uh, uh, shining bright. Uh, joining us, last but not least, is OfficeHours.Global's own Alex Lindsay. Hello, Alex. Hello, hello. Good to be here. Good it's not to have no, you there, here. There's no snow here. There's no tundra where I am. <laughs> what, Only a little bit I south like of it's, you. It's all very uh, controlled environment, though, where you are. It's perfect sharpness of your, your video. <laughs> and uh, do, do you have, like, just quiet fans running. How does your AC work to, to make sure the, the yeah. mics don't pick it up? 
what's funny is, is there's actually like this this dance that goes on in my my house has got a lot of southern facing windows and so there's like uh, my air conditioning can't actually keep up with it so i get up very early in the morning i get up at 3 30 or 4 in the morning and i open all the all the doors in the front mm-hmm. and i let the, the i let the house get down to a unreasonably cold you know it's because it, it, it gets very cold here in northern california as you know so it's I mean, I'll get down in the 50s, and so I can bring the house down into the low 60s, and then it just slowly goes up, and the air conditioning does as best it can, and then it's about 75 uh, when it's at its hottest, and then it fades back down again. And if I forget to do it, then it's 90. <laughs> so, so it is. It does <laughs> get pretty hot. So. 90. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So, so it's it's there's like a dance that I do every morning to keep it cool. Um, well, I uh, it, it seems like you have that dance well rehearsed. Um, let yep. us kick things off here. Uh, I want to start with a story that I saw fly by that, um, Renee, I have a feeling you have some thoughts on because you do a good job yeah. of kind of looking for the FUD and trying to help with the FUD. Um, there is a report in Mac Rumors and also available in some other places uh, based on some YouTube channels uh, that are claiming that the base 13-inch MacBook Pro, so this is the new MacBook Pro with the M2 chip, so old chassis, new uh, chip, has significantly slower, quote, significantly slower SSD read and write speeds than the 13-inch MacBook Pro with M1 chip of yesteryear. So can we talk about this? What What is going on here? Yes. Why are the r- read speeds <laughs> slower? And should everyone just throw out their M2 MacBook Pros and wait for the next model? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, like, a couple quick things. Like one, it's it's become normal to catastrophize any new product launch from any major vendor. Like there's just like 18 YouTube videos saying how terrible and broken it is at launch. And I, and I feel for consumers because it's, it's a lot of technical information and it's really hard to sort of muddle through it. In this specific case, the... The basic version, like, so there's NAND flash chips. That's what the storage really is. They're just chips. They're not actual drives anymore. And over time, it becomes more expensive to make the older, smaller versions of those. So that's why you get a natural progression, you know, from 32 gigabytes to 64 gigabytes to 128 gigabytes. You'd think that the smaller ones are always cheaper, but whatever they mass produce is always cheaper. So with the M2 MacBook Pro, Apple moved the base model from two 128 uh, gigabytes uh, NAND flash chips to one 256 gigabyte chips because my understanding is that's that's what is being mass produced now. That is the one that they could get and ship in a timely and non-price destructive manner. So they just put the single slot in there. The downside for that is that you lose parallelism. When you have two of the chips, in many cases, they can both work at the same time. It's like having a scary raid. You're just reading and writing to both of them simultaneously. Now, it's only the 256 gigabyte model. Um, people are reacting as though Tim Cook came to their house and slapped them. It, it's just that model, which most people aren't buying. Like most people, when you ask them which one they're buying, it's not that one, but they're still super angry. Uh, and it's also not something that you would notice in many situations. The way Apple does it is they have a minimum spec for any part. And that's like saying, uh, in order to be on the Apple Olympic team, you have to run the 100 meter dash in 10 seconds. They don't care if you run it in 9.9, 9.8 or 9.7, but you better run it in 10 seconds. And then they'll just pick the team members and some are faster and some are slower. And we saw this with like TSMC A9 chips being slightly faster than, or slightly better battery life than the Samsung fabbed ones. Or we also saw like some LG screens have been better than Samsung screens. It, it, it very, the Qualcomm modems were better than Intel modems and people would try to figure out which one they had in their phone. So there's always some, when you start multi-sourcing components or doing different configurations of components, you can often run into certain specs that are less performant than others. But for the vast majority of things, like if you have a super ultra high speed MVNE, uh, you know, Samsung X2 drive that you're copying back and forth from, it will copy back and forth in single and not, not in parallel. And you will notice like, a, like the, the speed is basically halved. But if you're doing almost anything else, if you're buying the baseline model, uh, my guess is you'll have minimal to no, like you, 90% of people wouldn't even notice the difference. So just confirming then, this is, you know, because sometimes I think uh, you have that situation where you have these people who are quickly testing these things and looking for, as you said, the the headline feature. Gotcha. And sometimes yeah. there's inaccuracy, right? Uh, yeah. But this, as far as you know, is an accurate representation. It's yes. just that you feel that the people will not probably notice this in their use of the, the device. It's accurate, but they've they've lacked a lot of context. Like, like if you tell somebody... 
uh, very specifically which model it affects, that's more helpful than people just because my com my YouTube comments are filled down with people who think that every model is broken and the entire machine uh. should be melted down, which is never good because some people really want this machine and they shouldn't be made to feel like like educate them, please educate them, but don't don't uh, terrify them. Right. Educate, don't terrify. I think that's a, that's a fair estimation. Andy, um, what, what are your, your general thoughts on this as well? Because I think, uh, you know, these, I, I, I've always appreciated it. So I, I, for folks who don't know, I produce this show each week, um, which means watching it while uh, everybody's talking and, and sort of figuring out what stories go where. And so I have a, a pretty good line of kind of everybody's um, the, the, the things on which they focus. And Andy, I do feel like you have a good focus on uh, folks who maybe don't have as big of a budget as others and the <laughs> the folks who are stepping into, and I don't mean that you yourself don't have a big budget, but no, I just no, think you're no, very I, mindful you're <laughs> of the entire audience is what I'm saying. So I just was curious yeah. about your thoughts on this uh, in general. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think Renee has, has, that, has a great point that uh, there's a di there is a difference between information and understanding, uh, and one of the one of the liabilities and one, one of the defects of a lot of reviewers uh, and a lot of people who write about tech, myself included, is that uh, we're just excited to find out something that is interesting or. Uh, not necessarily the first thing you'd think of. And when you find out that, ooh, well, geez, I wonder why the performance of the storage is not as high as this other thing that has to be. I wonder if, I, I wonder if, uh, if Apple is, isn't getting the golden chips, the golden DRAMs uh, from, uh, from the assembly line. And the things at some point you have to back off and say, well, how much is this going to affect the consumer? And definitely talk about it because it's news, it's something interesting, and will help people understand how these things are put together and how uh, a MacBook gets the performance that they're supposed to get but at the at the end of the day how is it going to limit what you can do with this 2022 uh, macbook pro how does it make it a, a problematic device and the the answer is well no uh, it doesn't make it problematic at all if you can it, i don't think that one of the one of the best pieces of advice that i can give anybody and sometimes i have to remind myself of it when i'm a consumer is that you don't buy you don't you don't choose to spend money based on uh, based on a chart you know, based on a graph, you base it, but you you do it based on how what is going what is going to be the experience of using this day to day, hour to hour, uh, and honestly, uh, the sensitive uh, when when I'm looking at a at a MacBook, the the state of the keyboard, how does the keyboard feel? Are the ports where they should be, or or is it, I'm always am I always going to be pulling out a power cable? Does the screen look absolutely wonderful? How much of a pain in the butt is it going to be? That's going to be a bigger effect than simply this benchmark by this very very smart, very, very technically uh, assured and very, very competent tester tells me that the RAM on this model is not going to be as good as the RAM on this other model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think that's uh, well put. All I right. Will, I will also uh, say that as, as the owner of a 2020 20 MacBook, I, uh, 2020 MacBook, maybe it's not an antique. I'm sorry. I mean... <laughs> Well, and, so that, and, that's, and, why I that's, that's why I laughed at the start. It's like, for owners of... <laughs> Sorry. And, and, you know, I, I think that for the, for the folks that would need this, the drive space to be a lot faster, um, I don't think they'd be using the 13-inch, to be honest. <laughs> like, I, right, I think that they'd be using right. the 16 because if you're well, doing heavy video, the 13-inch is too small. You know, like, it's just, it's too small to work. I own a four, the 13-inch or 14-inch and it's, it's too small. To do, to do, like, the kind of things that you'd be doing lots and lots of heavy video... Um, you know, I think that you'd, you'd probably end up, so I think that the folk, the, the, especially folks that would buy a 256, I don't think they'd ever know unless they read this article that it was going, that it was going slow. And I don't, I just mean that in a way that, that it is, you know, it, it's the target audience, um, is different. And as soon as you add one more, as soon as you go to 512, I think it works fine. And I would, I, I recommend getting a small drive, but I would never recommend getting a 256 at this point. It barely, I mean, you just, you'll have all kinds of problems. Uh, at that at that storage size, so I don't even know if I, I mean I, I think to meet a minimum cost that they can put on the website, they have a two fifty six version, but I would yeah. highly recommend not doing that. And for thin clients for enterprise, because those the the lower end MacBooks even are that. the ones that they buy just to use all their web apps and, and junk like that. Yeah, it's but just I, I would so you know, to Alex's small. point. If if like if you can only do single channel on the NAND at two fifty six, just go to five twelve. I know I love yeah. spending Tim Cook's money as much as the next person, but <laughs> like it's it's twenty twenty two. Just go to go to five twelve. Yeah. Everyone will love you and make it up on on the higher end. You know they got yeah. make it up on the on the Mac Mini that Alex is going to buy twenty three of next yeah. fall. 
<laughs> That's true across the board. Uh, 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 even on the, even on the phones, one of the deciding factors for me between uh, when I when I had a thousand dollars to spend on a top tier phone last year, uh, and I serious I did wind up with a with an uh, with a uh, with a Pixel Six Pro instead of a, a, a new iPhone. I really did seriously consider uh, switching back to iPhone because I think they're both super excellent devices, very very in tune to my needs. And what it came down to is that I could get five hundred twelve gigabytes of storage. Uh, twice as much as the iPhone for the exact same amount of money. And with everything else in my book was so close that I would much rather have the double the storage. I really think that that that's across the board. Apple maybe should consider, again, it's great to spend Tim Cook's money like this, but that's <laughs> store. You can't when, when storage is soldered on the board and is not replaceable by any hand other than the hand of God itself. Wow, that is that could be a, an important deciding factor. All right, um, let's move on because we've got a lot to talk about in terms of uh, data protection, data collection, and uh, how Apple kind of falls into this scope. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is uh, how the, there are some U.S. senators who are asking the FTC to look into Apple and Google over how they are doing mobile tracking. Of course, the, the large concern here is uh, after the Supreme Court uh, ruled to basically undo the protections we had under Roe versus Wade, um, the, the, this large concern about how app developers and the data that is tracked within those apps and the companies, uh, these big companies um, who are collecting this data, how they could in turn hand over that tracking data to the government if uh, that was asked for by a state government or even the federal government. And so there was a letter that uh, FTC Chair Lena Khan received from uh, Ron Wyden, Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker, Sarah Jacobs. And it actually goes as far as to, according to Engadget, accuse the tech giants of engaging in unfair and deceptive practices by enabling the collection and sale of hundreds of millions of mobile phone users' personal data. Uh, and they're saying, hey, you need to look into this, especially now. And uh, there have been a number, I've seen some tweets kind of fly by where you've got different folks at Apple um, who have said the, uh, the, the, the cycle tracking that's built into the health app is encrypted both ways. And so Apple doesn't have access to that at all. But a lot of people will use third party apps for this. And so there's a big concern, I think, going forward about data protection. And I would love to hear some thoughts from all of you, not on this you know, subject necessarily in and of itself, but let's give some tips to the audience. Let's, let's help uh, them know how to better protect their data using these devices because all of us uh, have more knowledge of that. I mean, Alex, you go as far as to, uh, in some instances, need to very much protect your data because of uh, clients that you have at 090.media. So what are some uh, ways that we can better protect ourselves? And maybe then, Renee, you can give us some uh, certainty from the uncertainty surrounding the encryption and backup of our health data. I, I guess what I would say is that your phone is the least of your worries. <laughs> so, so you're like like what Apple and, and Google is doing. It's probably the least of your worries as far as as how you're being tracked. I think that there was an article that I read some years ago about. Uh, I think it was Target was sending uh, prenatal stuff to a 16 year old or 17 year old girl, and her father was very upset that she's getting this stuff um, because, of course, she's not pregnant. Because, but and and turned out she was. Um, and the thing is, is that that the the but the reason that Target got that was buying preferences and all kinds of other things and searches and and so the thing is, is I mean Google maybe from a Google search perspective, but but the the issue is, is that um, you know what your phone does and what your position is is not really the problem. It's you, the entire ecosystem that you sit inside of, um, everything that you buy, everything that you search, all the things, those tracking pixels, all the things. You, you know, the number one thing I would say is that every time a website asks you, take the time. Every time a website says, do you want to track this data to turn it off? Like, and, and when you, when someone asks, you know, anything that you can do to stop being tracked, you should do that. Um, I don't think that what Apple and what the phones themselves are doing is pr probably particularly um, the problem. It's you're living in an ecosystem where the AI is figuring out a lot about you um, before you, uh, before you know it. Renee, There's a couple thoughts? things here. Like for me, 
Yeah, for me, like they're they're conflating a couple of things, which is very like I, I worry about regulation all the time, and I worry more when they conflate it. Uh, and it's not a political thing because everybody does this. It's the same way like they always want to talk about terrorism when they want to break you know encryption, uh, and now it feels like they're using privacy as a way to to pass regulation that I don't think is well considered. Like one of their problems is with the IDFA, the individualized numbers that Apple uses to replace the actual device ID for advertisers. There is. Apple is trying to lock down iOS as much as they can, but they recognize that there is a need for campaign management for people who are advertisers and for people who do want to opt into this. And there are people who are willing to opt into into advertising if it means free or low cost services, and they have every right to do that. On on you know, Apple recognizes that right. Apple was like a very privacy fundamentalist around iOS seven eight time, but they realize there's a whole bunch of reasons. You know, like, for example, like if you're not able to handle your own health care data, like if you have a caregiver, you might need to share that kind of information. They've gotten much more pragmatic about it. And I think what they're doing is reasonable. I know there's been some concern along with with the same uh, letter that that Apple is doing first party preferencing over third party. And that's a bunch of nonsense as well. Everyone's platform is first party to them. Apple has absolute knowledge of you on iOS, even though they choose not to. Not to leverage that, but like Google has absolute knowledge on on Android and Chrome, and Facebook has absolute knowledge and the big blue app and Instagram and and WhatsApp. Apple's mostly been cracking down on how they follow you from device to device, website to website, app to app, and that 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 should not be conflated with the the platform knowledge itself. But I do think on the flip side, people are rightly concerned, especially right now, when different states are passing different laws to shield people from being sued, but allowing people to be sued. Nobody wants to be sued. Uh, and it's it's uncertain what that future looks like, but access to your data is gonna be a big part of both you know, prosecuting and defending those, those lawsuits. And health data, for example, in iOS, it's not, like people worry because their iMessages are, for, for example, are backed up in the clear. And Apple has like a fail safe versus a fail secure system where things that they believe you would you would be much worse off losing than having stolen, they, they back up fail safe. So like your wedding photos, your, your children's photos, things like that, they would rather be able to help you recover those things because they believe that's the greater chance of harm. But for things like health data uh, or like Siri suggestions, all those sorts of things, those go through secure cloud kit uh, and those are much harder to retrieve in any usable form, maybe impossible to retrieve in a usable form. And that's the sort of protection I think that needs to be offered. I've thought for a while, and I know people will laugh at this, but our phones are basically external cybernetics. They're the closest thing we have to like mind, brain, and sensor capacity outside of our own bodies. And they, I, I believe they have as much of a right to privacy over what you put in that little digital box as, you know, maybe spousal privilege or clerical privilege or, or doctor-patient privilege. Uh, that doesn't exist in law. So now people have to be very careful about what they put online and platforms have to be very careful about how they treat that data. Mm -hmm. And this is another thing. So uh, there was a report from Reuters uh, that says Russia is actually threatening uh, Apple and other uh, companies with fines if they don't store their data in the country. So basically, uh, if these folks are storing their data out of the country, um, then they could be hit with fines for not storing it inside of Russia. And, uh, you know, different different groups of folks are going to tell you different things about why they want that America data stored there. America wants TikTok data located in America. We just like right. America better than Russia. <laughs> yeah, we, exactly. Um, and different countries, of course, have different data protection laws. Um, I'm curious, though, do you, is this going to be the next kind of uh, tech battle in terms of, of where data is being stored, how it's being stored, how much access uh, a group has to that data? Um, we we saw for a long time kind of a, a, growing, uh, a growing market of of services and features built into the operating systems that we use that are all about uh, finding what data is being stored and being able to delete that. And you've got Apple with its ad tracking transparency and uh, Amazon provides uh, a, a place where you can go online, a portal where you can see the different requests that you've sent before. But is the next step kind of from the top down as opposed to from the consumer level? Are we going to start to see governments playing more of a role, at least uh, out in, in 
in front of people on how our data is stored. Like uh, more of Russia and other countries saying, no, 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 we want our citizens' data stored here as opposed to there. Well, uh, the difficulty is always going to be that what are they going to be using the data for? Uh, and I'd like to go back to the United States, if we could, uh, and say that we we are now facing the, the chickens are coming home to roost. And here's what the problems of having absolutely no legislation, no rules, no liability on the uh, use and abuse of personal data, particularly location data. Uh, this is this is the problems that people can have. It's not all about oh gee, I'm getting I'm being targeted with ads. I don't want it, it creeps me out. Now we're in a situation where. Uh, Believe it or not, if uh, if uh, if a, if a person uh, miscarries, and someone in their office is a quote activist unquote, uh, in a state which uh, in which uh, uh, aborting uh, aborting a pregnancy is illegal, suddenly does that person have the ability to make hey you know what I'm going to make you try to prove that you did not actually abort this pregnancy, uh, and I'm going to buy location data just on the private on the private market to try to make that case against you. And even if I can't get you put in jail, I'm going to harass you and I'm going to make your your, your life horrible at a time when you had to make a, a really uh, a very challenging decision to to begin with. And that right, that right now is very, very legal. Up to about a couple of months ago, you could simply buy a package of data of who uh, who visited a certain Planned Parenthood uh, clinic uh, at, at a certain date. Uh, that's just, again... Put it on your MasterCard. That's that's as as easy as it got, uh, and it's very very simple to understand why a lot of this legislation is based on asking the the language they used with the FTC, meaning that this is deceptive and this is unfair. That's precisely chosen language because the FTC is empowered to act on deceptive and unfair uh, products, deceptive and unfair features and services. They don't need an act of Congress in order to go after Apple, Google, Facebook, whoever against that. But the next step is to actually get some laws on the books just to define here is what people can do with uh, here's what uh, c uh, companies can do with uh, with private location data one of the things that the, that they're trying to pursue there is to try to uh, attach some of this data to to HIPAA uh, that's the only uh, medical only medical data is the only cut type of data in the United States in which there is some sort of limitation on uh, what you could what a someone who acquires that data can do with it in terms of making money off of it and also the requirements of how pri uh, how they have to maintain privacy as they're transacting that data even when they're legally allowed to do so so this is this is what we're facing right now we this is not hypothetical anymore this is where people are going to be really hurt there's going to be true damage done uh, both from an illegal point of view people who want to acting on their own harm people who just want to maintain control of their own bodies and state attorneys generals attorneys general who want to be elected next time and they know that rounding up a of people who can't defend themselves, people who don't have the resources to avoid going to jail, people who don't have the resources to uh, th that other people have when they're dealing with their own health concerns, uh, that these are the people who are going to get uh, have real damage. Now, just to get, I'll, I'll wind things up because I'm sorry. Clearly, clearly, uh, this is like an answer to the last question and not the one that you just answered. So I'm sorry for going on uh, quite so uh, quite so long. Obviously, we've been all uh, taking a look a long look at this over the past week, uh, but. Yeah, it's 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 hard to know whether making sure that uh, consumer data is landed in the same country in which those people exist that could be a bad thing. That could be a good thing. Uh, if you you don't want to, you don't want to. I don't necessarily want my data to be in the hands of a country that believes that all the data that every corporation collects is part of a of a, of a state asset, uh, or even part of a state intelligence asset. On the mm -hmm. other hand, I do want my data in the United States to be protected by laws that say that. By the way, no, you are not going to access this from from across borders. You are not going to. If you do have legal access to it, you're going to have to demonstrate demonstrate why you need access to it. And furthermore, in a, in, a, in a fantasy future in which I legally own this data and can ba and I'm basically just giving a company a license to use it and can revoke that license, I can say, guess what? I've decided that you don't want to, I don't want anybody to have any access to this whatsoever and pull it and make sure that that will stick because the server in which that data is located is has simply made that guideline and simply removed it. 
All right. Um, we are going to take a quick break. Leo Laporte will uh, actually have the break ready for you so you can hear about Nomad. Take it away, Leo. This episode of Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by Nomad. I am so excited. My Nomad stuff has come. I'm a big fan. I've had Nomad cases and watches for years. Now they have these chargers. This is a MagSafe charger. This thing is really, really heavy. This is called the Base One with MagSafe. You just put your phone right on it. It's got a strong magnet, so it can't fall off, and it charges beautifully. Look at this, right? Boom, right like that. Isn't that great? Uh, actually, they also have one with a watch on it, and I'd, I'd show you that, but Lisa's already steal, stolen it because <laughs> she loves it so much. You might remember this. In fact, I, was, I think I kicked in on their first Kickstarter back in 2012. Uh, they were down in Santa Barbara. They wanted to build ultra-rugged, minimalist tools for the 21st century that would integrate seamlessly into your everyday carry, and they have done it amazingly. In nine years, they've expanded to offer a wide range of mobile accessories from iPhone cases and Apple Watch straps, wireless chargers, premium wallets and passport holders, all crafted with that beautiful Horween leather. This is the Horween leather. Oh, Oh, I love this is the you if you're a leather buff, you know the name Horween. They're a, a classic tannery in Chicago. They still use the old school techniques. They were founded in 1905. It is the best leather out there. When you've got Horween leather on your phone, it just adds a touch of class and beauty. And what's nice about the leather accessories uh, is that they I have to bring in one of my old cases. They have this rich patina over time. And it just it just it just breaks in so beautifully, and I love I love how they smell. Nomad offers wireless charging solutions. I I showed you the base one, perfect for Apple devices, Apple Watch, AirPods. Uh, they offer AC adapters too. Their new GAN adapters, of course, are amazing. Tiny but powerful, small but mighty. Thirty watt, sixty five watt GAN adapters. Uh, they were tired of dealing with flimsy charging cables. So they, uh, they set out to engineer some of the best, most beautiful cables around, reinforced with a double-braided Kevlar outer sheath and strong metal alloy connectors. So they last and last and last. Every cable should be built like this, engineered for extreme durability and heavy and everyday use. They're also, by the way, and we always want to mention this, a climate-neutral certified brand. i got to show you. I've been waiting for this to come, my, my new watch band is in this is the steel band it's so gorgeous comes with a tool to add or take out links nice heavy beautiful band i'm gonna put that on my watch right now just gorgeous thank you nomad nomad is and always will be a company that prioritizes design and quality over everything else one of the most important uh, aspects to nomad when they're designing new products is they use the highest quality longest lasting materials you can tell when you hold something from Nomad, it's got quality. It just feels great. And all their concepts are designed in-house from the ground up. They're not white-labeled somebody else's existing product. This is, this is Nomad exclusive. Go to nomadgoods.com slash MacBreak. If you use the promo code MacBreak, 10% off your first purchase of any Nomad accessory. Nomadgoods.com slash MacBreak. Promo code MacBreak. It's a limited time offer, so don't wait. Nomadgoods.com slash Mac Break. And now back to Mac Break Weekly. All right. Thank you, Leo. And thank you, Nomad, for sponsoring this week's episode of Mac Break Weekly. We are back from the break. I, Micah Sargent, am here with Andy Anatko, Renee Ritchie, and Alex Lindsay. And it's time to talk about patents, everybody's favorite thing. Uh, so this is kind of a wild story. Uh, you may remember way back in 2017, if uh, you're a bit of an Apple nerd, that uh, Qualcomm sued Apple uh, over a uh, patent dispute saying that all of Apple's devices infringed on a bunch of Qualcomm's own patents. And what ended up happening was Apple was like, hey, look, no, not really. This, this, is, this isn't really a valid thing that you're claiming. Um, but they did eventually come to an agreement in 2019 uh, where Apple was able to use Qualcomm's uh, chips in iPhones and other devices. And it resulted in, according to Reuters, a license to tens of thousands of Qualcomm patents, including the two at issue, but it allowed that case to continue, that case uh, where Qualcomm said, 
Apple is infringing on our patents. It ended up being that uh, the board ruled in favor of Qualcomm, and so Qualcomm won that case. And here is the most recent thing. Uh, Apple said, look, we're kind of worried that when this whole uh, agreement comes to an end, when this settlement kind of comes to an end, that Qualcomm is just going to re-sue us and we're going to have to start all over. Uh, the agreement expires in 2025, or if they all agree, it would be extended to 2027, at which point it would uh, expire. And so Qualcomm in theory, could sue again at that point and start the whole process over again. So what happened was Apple went to the Supreme Court, well, went to the courts and said, we would like to sort of restart this litigation and, and bring an end to the uh, the patent dispute so that we can just get rid of the chance that Qualcomm will sue us because we've been paying the money, we've got the licenses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But Renee, aren't we moving, isn't Apple moving to a Qualcomm chip-free design on many of its devices anyway? I, I was going to say, I, I personally believe that Qualcomm shouldn't have won a lot of those lawsuits. I think that they have, uh, what's the right word, way to put this? <clears throat> they have not uh, stuck with the, the spirit of free, you know, uh, non-discriminatory sharing of patents. They've been granted a lot of essential technologies that is very, very hard to work around. Uh, and they've been demanding exorbitant, like, ridiculous licensing fees from everybody for years. Licensing fees that significantly increase the price of everybody's phones by like 100 bucks, 120 bucks. And if every licensor wanted that for their technology, couldn't afford to make phones anymore. But they keep winning. So, I mean, who am I, who am I to say? The, the part that you mentioned is that Apple has a cross-licensing deal with uh, Qualcomm now. So you can look at it almost like, you know, in the early days, Apple licensed ARM designs, ARM microprocessor architecture designs, and they used like Cortex A9 cores in the very early versions of the iPhone. But over time, they started introducing first their own CPUs and their own GPUs and their own neural engines until finally they had made the whole entire chipset. It's completely custom uh, IP at this point. They've been working with Qualcomm modems. They had an X55, an X60 in the current iPhone, X65 in the next iPhone. And they've been working to replace that. They already do their own baseband. They already do their own antennas. Uh, I'm not sure what they do for an RF solution. A modem is actually really complicated. Qualcomm builds it into their, X, their, into their um, Snapdragon processors for a lot of devices. Apple has a thin Qualcomm modem on top of their A-series processors in iPhones, and they've been looking to replace that. Uh, Guo Mingqi tweeted this morning that, that he believes Apple has failed in their current modem plans and is going to stick with Qualcomm for another two years, so X70, X75 maybe. Uh, but they're still working on it. They're going to keep working on it. It's just... It's just really, really hard, and the more that the that Qualcomm wins these things, the harder it is for like MediaTek and Samsung and Apple to compete and look no further. You know, Andy and I both have the Pixel Six Pro, and I believe that's the only non five G, sorry, non Qualcomm five G radio uh, in the U.S. And I know all of us, both of us, everybody who has one would sure prefer it if those patents were were actually like lived up to the friend promise they originally made, because we get way better reception. Hmm. Hmm. Things that make you go, hmm. Uh, yeah, this, I feel like this has been going on for such a long time. And <laughs> the fact that it kind of just keeps climbing through, climbing through, climbing through. Uh, I mean, I guess that is sort of the one of the things that you face as a large company is uh, the broad scope of or the, the broad range of patent trolls that exist out there. But I guess Qualcomm stands out, right? Because when I think of a patent What's troll in particular, I think of kind of uh, smaller companies that try for this. But uh, you were going to say something, Alex? Entity. Well, yeah, it's, it's it's not really a patent troll in this case. It's it's just that the what what usually is at the case here is what percentage of the phone value is created by the modem. Qualcomm mm -hmm. wants to be paid as a percentage of the total sale value, whereas Apple would like to make it a subset because you know the phone is, uh, you know, their their argument is that cellular service is a is a segment of value of the phone, but it's not the whole value of the phone. Because uh, it used to be phones, that's what they were there to do. At, at this point, when someone calls me, I'm like, why are you doing that? So, um, you know, and, and I think that the number one value of the phone now is the camera. Um, but, uh, but I think that Qualcomm, of course, their business is b providing these modems. And the problem really is for Apple is that doing, there are certain ways to get things done. And it's really hard not to step on a patent. You can create it yourself, but it's still very hard to step on a, 
to do, to build a modem without doing something that someone else has done before and patented. And so the real question is, you know, are you going to, you know, this gets into the, are you going to build a reasonable royalty structure? And so far the courts have agreed with Qualcomm that they can kind of create whatever number that they want, even if it negatively affects the entire industry. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I guess we'll, we'll – oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Andy. Just, just quickly, uh, the only thing I can really add is that this is a real, like, Apple versus Samsung sort of fight where it stopped being about, like, business a long time ago, and it just got to be about, okay, you're being jerks. We're not going to let you be jerks. Oh, yeah, well, you're the ones being jerks. If you think you're getting away <laughs> with trying to make us look like jerks, you're the real jerks. And so the, the negotiations between these two companies absolutely fell apart. Uh, and there's some, been some big wins, big losses on both sides uh, of uh, Qualcomm's like two of their patents got upheld and were determined. The juries basically said that, yeah, Apple did infringe on these two uh, patents. I think another judgment was that one of Qualcomm's patents was invalid. Uh, they got a judgment of like something like a buck 40 per phone sold during the infringing time. But yeah, this is this is a lot more than just, hey, we, we have some overlapping technologies or gee, we don't understand why we have to pay for the chips, but also have to pay a licensing fee for using the chips that you sold us. It, uh, it, it, it takes a while for just like the way the only way that the samsung lawsuit ended the only way the microsoft lawsuit en lawsuit ended was for basically mom or dad to, to come downstairs into the basement ask what all this noise was about saying look this is stupid i'm not dealing with this anymore you're going to shake hands and you're going to stop fighting and that comes in the form of a supreme justice supreme court that says we're done <laughs> you you keep making game chips you keep making phones and just stop bogging us we can't we're trying to, we're trying to play canasta upstairs um this okay i i'm losing my mind about this next story because i had never heard of uh zombie bugs um but welcome to to a world in which zombie bugs exist so uh the Register published a report about, um, of course, it's Google's Project Zero team is, uh, is, is the group behind security research for all sorts of devices, all sorts of platforms, all sorts of operating systems. And they are constantly checking things and trying to find bugs and uh, vulnerabilities in code. And so in this case, Safari's WebKit had a security bug that came as part of refactoring of the code. So let's dig into this a little bit because it's important to understand that uh, typically what happens is a bug is found and then the folks who work on that application, in this case Safari, uh, fix the bug, right? That's, that's what we hope. They fix the bug, they fix the vulnerability, they make it so that uh, bad actors aren't able to gain access uh, through this flaw. And uh, there are multiple ways to do this. You can sort of patch it and put it, you know, just sort of just sort of glom it together and make it work so that you can get out the next version. And then oftentimes folks have to go back and fix it again or fix it uh, fully. And then there is the uh, case where you may fix it entirely. And it just so happens that later on down the line, something else happens. So I will explain now. Uh, in this case, uh, quoting the register, Apple completely patched the hole when the vulnerability was detected in 2013. However, when refactoring Safari in 2016, the fix was regressed. And so from December 2016 until January of 2022, there was that vulnerability that existed in the wild, not because a new bug was present, but because an old bug was able to be used again. And so the engineers, uh, the researchers who work for Google's Project Zero team were kind of highlighting the fact that they these, um, these exploiters don't necessarily always have to come up wholesale with new ways of, of, uh, vulner of, of finding vulnerabilities to use against the system. Sometimes... All they have to do is use uh, an exploit that is close to the code that has been used in the past or even use the same thing if, like in this case, refactoring ended up removing the fix for that bug. So I just think it's kind of a... Um, kind of a wild uh, thing there that there's these now zombie bugs and zombie zero days that are out there where you think everything's fine, but then you go to sort of update and clean out the cruft. And some of the cruft you cleaned out, you actually uh, knocked something out that was supposed to be there to help fix the problem. 
yeah, until you meet the is, vampire this... bugs. <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 unfortunately, these are these are the new kind, the the fast moving zombies, where you can't just simply uh, go up a flight of stairs and get out get get out of their way. Yeah, this is this is uh, the, 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 and it should be noted that this is this is a Mac podcast and an Apple podcast, but this wasn't just affecting Safari. The same team, the same report reported similar problems in Firefox, similar problems in Chrome based browsers, and for the exact same problem, where they solved the, an issue from ten years old, and at some point when you build a new version of this, the the bug gets reintroduced, and it wasn't just simply uh, redoing the same mistake. It was the the the, the same uh, the same bug could be exploited though through a new path uh, that uh, would not have been available before. So, yeah, I mean it's just a, it's just a it's just a, an indication of how important it is to have uh, groups like this group at Google basically checking everybody's work, not just simply checking their own, uh, because it's only when put a piece of fresh eyes and nobody nobody is going to ruin anybody else's career in that same company uh, by pointing out that there's a security flaw in one of your own products. Well, and, and I think that also it, it speaks to the, it speaks to the, uh, when, when you say, why don't they just add one more button or why don't they just yeah. build integrations with this other, you know, this other format or, or API or whatever, every line of code is a, is a potential liability, <laughs> you know, like, so, so it, it, you know, it, and so you're opening up, you know, anytime you start doing things with other things or anytime you add a button or anytime you add another feature, it's a feature, but it's also a bug, you know, potentially in down the road. And it just becomes, and these are big teams and these all have to be managed. But when we, we wonder why, like, I know that we're uh, on some software that I'm working on right now, we're slowly opening it up to more people and, you know, it's just chaos. You know, so, so, you know, cause suddenly people start hitting it in different ways and, uh, and then, you know, and, and you add certain things and it's, you know, and th then you're reminded why you didn't do that in the first place. You know, like, you, you, you know, like, why didn't you, you know, why didn't you, you just kept it for yourselves and it worked perfectly. And so, so I think that that's, uh, you just, when you wonder why some developer doesn't just add something for you, um, some, you know, everything pulls another thread. Right. It's also right. like it's, web um, browsers are mostly like they're they're like their entire operating system. People will use them. Chrome OS effectively is a web browser. They are so big and they do they're so complex. They have so much functionality and increasingly, especially when you start getting into web apps and you know all the the components everyone wants to be able to run more like native code. Uh, the power that they have is remarkable. And also they go back so far, like even if you're just talking about WebKit, that goes back to KHTML Conqueror on, uh, on Linux, KDM Linux. Uh, and they, there's famous stories about them fixing a bug that then destroyed the rest of the browser because five years of code had been built on top of that bug and they had to rapidly try and fix everything else. So the, when you're dealing with this amount of complexity... Uh, the side effect of disclosing vulnerabilities is that everybody knows to look for them, everybody knows to look for adjacent vulnerabilities, and everybody knows to test periodically to see if the vulnerability came back because whatever code you did to fix it might have been refactored exactly like this and it's no longer effective. It is, it is the joy and pain of platform maintenance. <laughs> And uh, everybody just keep an eye out for the zombies. And apparently the vampires, which are next. Zombies. That's that's terrifying. Or the werewolf. Those are only bugs during the full moon, Micah. Those are... <laughs> but, 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 the good, but the good news is those are the modern kind too, so they're sexy, glittery vampires. That's the is true. Kate says, hey. <laughs> um, one more story here at the top uh, that I wanted to cover. Uh, so... It was actually in December that uh, the rule, let me find here. Ah, there we go. Uh, it was actually in December that the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act uh, went into effect. Um, however, enforcement of the law went into effect last week. Uh, what that means is that uh, folks are required to to the folks, rather, Apple and other groups are required to prove that the goods that are coming through the Xinjiang region um, were manufactured in a way that there was no forced labor involved in the supply chain. So any U.S. company who wants to import goods managed in that region have to show that there was not uh, forced labor involved. And I remember you folks talking about this way back when the law was kind of first going through the, the or the act was going through the system and the fact that Apple was doing some, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, was doing some lobbying and what ended up happening with that. 9to5Mac uh, quotes 
uh, I believe the New York Times, yeah, and talks about how one of the things that they wanted to have done was to include an extension on the deadlines for compliance, uh, release certain information about supply chains to congressional committees, but not to the public, because originally it said that that information was to be released to the public. And then also a... uh, a change requiring Chinese entities to be designated by the United States government as helping to surveil or detain Muslim minority groups in Xinjiang. And the idea there is that um, with the original act, it was kind of on the onus of Apple to or other companies to be the ones who were responsible for auditing and finding the companies who were doing this versus having the U.S. government be the ones responsible for auditing and finding the ones who are doing this. Um, In any case, uh, the act has gone into effect now. And again, as of yesterday, enforcement has taken place. So as far as we know, um, Apple and other tech companies have begun to show Uh, that they are not getting anything in the supply chain that is uh, involved with forced labor. I remember, Andy, at the time, you had done quite a bit of research on this. Uh, You were quoting some things um, that I hadn't seen. Uh, Do you know, as far as what is available to the public and like what we could look at and and audit ourselves. How do we know that these companies are actually following through with this? Or is this one of those, well, you just have to believe that they are because the government says they have to and they're passing that information off to the uh, the proper governmental uh, committees? Yeah, it's it's really really difficult because it's not just a it's it's not just a case of hey the, the uh, this company is working through this one sub this subcontractor that is known to use forced labor. It's kind of diabolical the way that the Chinese government has been leveraging uh, prison labor and forced labor into the workflow. You could have a you could have a, a, a factory in which the workforce is completely mixed that way. So you're not going to get that. You're not going to get that indication just by the fact that this factory, uh, it went through this factory. You're not going to get that information just from the basis that, oh, well, look, this is, uh, we don't know, we don't know what was going on inside that factory, but we know that this, uh, that this particular factory is located in this region that that is served by prison labor because they are giving, uh, the government is also giving incentives to uh, build new factories adjoining to and near uh, places in which there are uh, uh, prison camps. So uh, I don't uh, I don't know what the right solution to this is because I can I can absolutely understand the argument from Apple side saying that look we don't have the we don't have the resources to determine uh, on a national basis who we should be dealing with and who who we should not be dealing with. We at least uh, we we at least need some guidance on uh, tell us tell us who not to hire and we will not hire them. On the other hand, the government and this law basically has to say that look, I, I, Apple, unless you want to turn over to us every single piece of documentation that you have on where you're getting your labor from, so that we can then do our own uh, point uh, point man investigation, this is not going to work at all. Uh, so yeah, and and in the meantime, uh, for us uh, for us consumers who definitely do not want to be supporting companies that are uh, that are using prison labor or using forced labor. Uh, where we're kind of stuck in the middle and when i and after having said some nasty things about the chinese government realize that in this country we're also using prison labor it's not it's not forced labor but nonetheless we are we do benefit from materials and processes that are from people who are not being paid market rate for their work by companies that are operating a for-profit prison to to provide that labor force but that's that there's no there's no equality between what's happening in china and what's happening here but let's all point out that it's it's a difficult thing to get from a consumer point of view if you're going to decide that I don't want uh, any I don't want prison labor to work on anything that I pay for I don't want forced labor to get to work on anything I pay for it's going to be a very very difficult line for you to cross you're going to it's mostly down to individual activists that can produce the documentation uh, at risks to their own lives and then make that public and basically put the pressure on companies uh, upwards of the stream to change their ways I think uh, you really pointed out something that um, I think we do forget, and I'm glad that you pointed out uh, about what the U.S. Uh, is responsible for in in some ways as well. Um, I'm glad that this this law is in place, and I'm certainly going to do some more digging on that as well, just to see kind of uh, yeah. what what reporting is available and what is not. Alex, yeah, I, I think that overall you, you're seeing a very slow move 
of a lot of com companies trying to diversify from China because it's just going to become harder. <laughs> like this is all going to get this is all going to keep on getting more and more complicated with China um, between what they're doing in those po in in the prison populations as well as what they're doing in Taiwan as well as what they're doing in the South China Sea. Um, there is a level of what China's doing that is just going to continue to become, you know, it was a great deal for a while. This was a great trip for everybody. But now everyone's kind of, eh, I don't know if I like this ship. <laughs> you know, so, so the, the, you know, this is it's a lot of waves. Everything is complicated. Um, and so you're seeing Apple move, move factories and to expand where those factories sit. And that's, you know, and so the, um, it's, it, it's not something they can just do overnight. It's not something they can just say, okay, well, we're not going to do this because they can't build their products right now. But you're definitely seeing not just Apple, but many companies diversifying from China um, because they they it's not even what's happening right now. It's what they think potentially happen over the next decade. Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to take another quick break before we come back with lots more. We've got a lot to discuss, including some rumors coming up. Uh, but first, let's hear about Peloton from Leo. Hey, everybody, I wanted to jump in here on MacBreak Weekly. I know I'm, I'm on vacation, but this is a product I really have a strong affinity for. I've been using for years. I bought my Peloton bike when it first came out. So it's four or five years now. I, I used to go to, you know, the gym, take those classes. Uh, but it was inconvenient. I had to go on their schedule, not mine. I just wanted something at home that would give me the same quality workout with really great trainers without all the trouble of, you know, driving over to the gym. I discovered Peloton. I have never looked back. You always look forward with Peloton. You, you know, if you want something in your house that gives you incredible fitness, take a look at Peloton. And their instructors, I'm team Cody. I love Cody Rigsby, but they have, uh, they have so many great instructors who make it fun to work out. And it's not just the bike, by the way. They've got a treadmill now. I use that. My trainer has both the bike and the treadmill at his uh, at his facility. He's got a little barn with all the equipment. And of course, Peloton's there. So I run on the treadmill at, with my trainer. I ride the bike at home. Uh, and you don't have to just use, they have, they have stretch, they have yoga, they have relaxation, they have weights, they have cool down, warm up, so there's a huge range of different things you can do with Peloton. And because their instructors are so good, they're highly trained fitness pros, and they know how to motivate you. They're really, this is one of the advantages Peloton has. It's not just somebody who's you know lives around the corner. They have the best instructors in the world. They can get the best instructors in the world. So you're going to the best classes in the world. I just love it. And you don't have to be super fit. Look at me. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, but it sure gets you fit. It's great for all levels. Uh, they, of course, with all of their uh, uh, classes, they have a, you know, they, they show you how to modify so you don't have to kill yourself. I just love, uh, honestly, the cycling. They've added a game now where you turn the knob and you're in different lanes. It's kind of like Guitar Hero. Um, Actually, it's more like Beat Saber, but you're on a bike instead of a saber. And it's so much fun. 20 minutes, half an hour goes by like that. I'm sweating. I'm feeling great. I'm energized, ready for my day. Thousands of live and on-demand classes. So you can go to a live class if you want to keep a schedule. That's fun. In fact, when you when you have a milestone, you like to go to the live class so they can say, uh, there's Chief Twit. He's his, you know, it's his thousandth class or whatever, <laughs> which is fun. They've got strength training, yoga, running. You could try new types of movement. Nobody's looking at you. you. You don't have to get all fancy dressed up. There's nobody, you know, ogling you. You're in your house. If it's not fun, you're not going to do it. That's why I love Peloton. They make every class fun. And the music. I learn about new music, uh, but they also play classics. I just, uh, I just did a, a Peloton with uh, classic women of rock. Man, that was good. Oh, is it? I was singing out loud. The wheels were going round. Whatever your schedule is, Peloton works with you. And no more weirdos in the locker room, okay? Right now is the perfect time to try out Peloton. This is a deal. I want you to take advantage of this. The Peloton Bike Plus is now $500 less. That's its best price yet. And that includes free delivery and setup. So start thinking about where you'd put your bike. Start thinking about all the great classes you're going to take. More game-changing prices available on the original Peloton bike at Peloton Tread 2. Visit OnePeloton.com 
For more, O-N-E-P-E-L-O-T-O-N dot com. One Peloton dot com. I love my Peloton. <laughs> I love it. And you will too. Uh, it has changed. I have to say it's changed my life. One Peloton dot com. Thank you, Peloton. In fact, I'm just going to go to a Peloton right now and I'll see you guys later. Enjoy. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Leo, for that. Uh, and thank you to Peloton, of course, for sponsoring this week's episode of Mac Break Weekly. We are back and it is time to talk about some rumors and things. Uh, Mark Gurman over at Bloomberg, of course, has uh, his Power On newsletter, and it's often chock full of interesting tidbits, both things he thinks might happen, things that he has heard may happen, and everything in between. Uh, one of those is a rumor about the Apple Watch Series 8. Uh, that would be the next version of the Apple Watch, and uh, that it could potentially include a low power mode. So so a mode that, of course, lets the battery last a little bit longer. But I don't know, Renee. I don't have battery issues with my current Apple Watch. Who's this gonna? Who's this uh, low power mode gonna be for? Uh, Alex Lindsay, because he wants to, you know, keep it on while he sleeps <laughs> it's, it's and then so, have it charged back up. <clears throat> like, like, I can see, so I can see him me. smiling even though he's not on screen. Yeah, yeah no, I, it's it's very much for me. I'm always like, oh, I forgot to to, to uh, when I saw the low power mode, I was like, oh, I might have to get a new watch. <laughs> like, I'm, maybe I'm the only one. I, I try to, I try to charge it when I'm on office hours in the morning. That's my, that's always my goal. And then I forget. And then two days go by. And the next thing I know, I'm, I'm somewhere. That's because office hour lasts for two days. Exactly. Exactly. So, so anyway, Can yeah, I no, I, this, I think that, Yeah, please. I was going to say like, some people are really concerned because it sounds like Apple's going to be using the same, um, cores. Oh, in, I saw this. Yes. S8 that they use in the S7 and S6. And I just wanted to take an opportunity to explain what Apple is not a merchant silicon vendor, and that means that they don't have to worry that their chip has to go in a wide range of devices. Like it, with Intel and AMD, they never know where their chip is going to end up, like in what kind of device. Everything from a very low power tablet style device up to like a mini tower device. And so they have to build a lot of capability into those. Sometimes it's not used and sometimes it's not enough, but that's the best they can do. Apple builds everything specifically for the device requirements. That's what they have been told by the hardware team, the software team, you know, the marketing team that they need to provide for this device. And that means that they can like tailor fit the, the silicon to the solution so they don't have to build in anything extra. Uh, and in fact, it's better for efficiency if they don't. They don't want to have any dark silicon, like nothing that's sipping power, not providing functionality. But it also means that they're not obsessed with performance the way that we are. And it's, that's sort of not fair because they're happy to talk about it whenever they're good at it. But the actual silicon team outside the marketing team, they care a lot about efficiency. They'll even forego some percentage of performance uh, in order to get better efficiency. Like battery life will always win for them. And so when you're looking at these chips, people are upset. Like, for example, M2 is not way more powerful than M1 or that they're not going to get a new. It's still going to be an A13 efficiency core in the Apple Watch. But the thing is, those are that's what the device calls for. Those are the capabilities they want to deliver. And the two things that bind that are time and physics. And we're getting real close on physics. We're going down to three nanometers soon. And after that, you know, Intel is already talking about angstroms. But we're going to hit very hard limits of physics where... Electricity starts to misbehave as we go smaller and smaller than that. So performance is going to become slower and slower to, to grow from this point on. There's no more easy fixes unless you're like Intel and, and NVIDIA and you're willing to try to pull more power than a house provides, you know, or you're just going to become super hot, super super number of cores. That doesn't work on a watch, doesn't work on ultralight computer. So what Apple's been doing is investing in off-core features. So even though, for example, we didn't get new uh, efficiency cores in the watch in the last two years, they added things like altimeters to them. They added a new uh, display driver for the always-on display. And they've been doing off-core silicon the same way they've added neural engines and uh, ProRes and code decode blocks to chips. That's increasingly where everyone's going to have to go. Intel's starting to follow along in this as well because they have to. There's just... The, the, there's just a limit to the amount of heat and power you can put into these tiny, tiny devices. So when you, when you see something like this, ask yourself, like, what do I need the extra power for? Are there apps that you can't run on your phone uh, or your watch? And are you willing to pay everything? Like the cost of mobile is power. You pay for everything with power. Are you willing to give up battery life to get it? And I think for most people, they would be super happy with the watch working the same, but lasting several hours longer. And it sounds like that's what Apple's investing in for the next one. Absolutely. Um, 
Now, on top of that Apple Watch, uh, there's talk of a, a ruggedized version, perhaps. So um, having a sport model that is a full-on sport model, that'd be the first time, Renee, I think that there's such a variant in the Apple Watch. The last time we had that was uh, Andy's favorite watch, which is the 18 karat gold Apple Watch, right? Now he's getting a Garmin competitor though. So Andy will be just as happy. <laughs> yeah, I saw that, uh, that Apple, it, basically the Apple Watch knocks it out of the park in almost every category of uh, wearable, except for the super fitness focused uh, premium market where yes. Garmin still owns uh, quite a bit yes. of it. So this is an attempt to kind of take that on. It, it haunts them and they will have <laughs> it. It haunts them. Do you think that that means on top of being more rugged, there will be what better sensors in that? Or is Apple more of a try to bring all of those sensors to all of the, the latest models? Like how, no, how will Apple differentiate, do you think? Okay. Like the sensors are super hard. Like Apple had their own um, blood sugar sensor, like when they were working on the Apple Watch, and it just it, it, they haven't been able to ship it. They bought like two, three companies that kept swearing they were close to it, haven't been able to ship it. That stuff is really, really hard, and just making a making a resilient like a rugged watch isn't going to help with that. I think it's really going to be designed to be a, a Garmin competitor, and that means probably like a higher class of of GPS because you want that to be super accurate and you want that to be super, you know, super powerful. Uh, and then like the rugged design, uh, probably bigger. I think the CAD file showed that it was bigger as well. Makes it easier to see when you're doing your excursions. I think that's what they, when, when you go beyond a marathon, when you're running across the Amazon, like you know, I think you're an excursionist at that point. But yeah, it'll, it'll just be Apple's version of, of what people are still using the Garmin for. That's what they do. Like they, they, they get very good at doing one thing and then they look at the nearest neighbor and then they expand into the nearest neighbor to try to increase their market. <laughs> Like an amoeba. I think, <laughs> yeah, I think ruggedness is the one feature that Apple's the Apple Watch is missing that it could really benefit from. Uh, to the ability to have a watch that it doesn't matter that if my wrist happens to be the exact same height as doorknobs, that that's not going to cost me a $350 watch or a screen repair. Uh, I, there are a lot of people that would much rather spend the extra $150 on an ugly, chunky case that means that this thing, they can take it on the road for two years and not worry about the thing breaking. That would be, that, that's more valuable to them than stainless steel or ceramic or anything uh, that would be befitting a, a Cartier watch. I, you know, I have a rugged, the rugged version of the Apple Watch. You can see it here. It's, it's yeah. already Oh, pretty, pretty what rugged. case is that? Yeah, this is the, I don't know, Spigen Rugged Armor Pro, you know, for the for the watch. And I just kept on banging my watches up so much that I have a little, I have one of the little screens that goes across the top and then I have a rugged on it and it doesn't look as pretty, but That's it's- Vader uh, Armor for his watch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But but I'll tell you, when I take it off, it looks it's still in mint condition because it's hmm. it's absorbed all of those hits because I I have a tendency to I, all my watches look pretty banged up, so it's it's a nice uh, nice addition. Nice. So yeah, you're covered. It cost you me like twenty five bucks. <laughs> I'm sure Apple will charge us more more for the record than the twenty five dollars that bit. I paid for the case. Yeah, 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 just a little bit. Now on top of that, there's rumor of a new Apple TV with a, a brilliant code name. Like you hear this code name and you're going, "Wow, that is exactly what I would name a secret Apple TV," and it's the most clever thing that they've ever come up with. Are you ready? J two five five. Wow. So anyway, that's not, the that's, uh, not, that's not the code name. Those are like, that's the letter. That's like that's the letter pairing. They all they all have like weird names. Like the original Apple TV was Lobot, like the Star Wars character. Like they they're, they have more colorful stuff they use internally. Okay, so it, then perhaps wrong wording there from uh, German in the newsletter. Uh, no, as it's opposed a code to code name, name it's just, just a boring one. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so there are more colorful ones that are out there. Uh, so this is one that has an A14 chip and uh, one more gig of RAM. Are we going to see, Renee, are we finally going to see a uh, HomePod with an with a iPad on top? Are we getting there or is this just going to be no. an Apple TV that supports the late, what is it next, 6K, 8K? What, what, what's no, next No, I think in, they, they want one range? that's going to have, I think the Apple TV they want next is just one that's going to have more parity with the headset so that the same features, uh, like if you want the features on your living room, it'll, you'll be able to have them on your living room screen and then you'll be able to have them in the VR experience. Not You won't need as much power for that because you're not letting up you know, dual 4K displays and all that kind of stuff. But uh, it'll, like the games and all the stuff that they're going to need to, to put into the AR headset, they want, they, they need a bigger market uh, to justify all the cost that that structure is going to put into them. The HomePod, the only HomePod rumor is a new HomePod Max, the HomePod Biggie. 
that, that's the next. What Apple, is. if Apple could nail the uh, the sharing functionality, that would be uh, like next level. Because right now, in order for me to or my partner to show what. Uh, either of us is looking at in the VR to the other person, you have to have the most recent uh, Chromecast device and even still it lags or you can pull up like uh, the app and look at it there, but it lags. It doesn't look very good. It's, it's crummy. That experience well, of trying to stream from like the they, VR headset. That, that's all done. They did that with AR kit. Like that, the AR kit, uh, everything from Memoji to AR kit to share play have just been beta testing for the VR headset feature. So when they showed you at Dub Dub 2018, I think, when they had two people walking around with iPads and a shared AR experience, that's for the headset. When they have like oh. you getting used to moving your emoji around, that's for the headset because that's going to be your avatar. You know, they're getting you, they're boiling the water on that. So you're you're used to having an AR presence. Share play when like it looks goofy when you have like a phone and you're holding it up and trying to get your TV to do something. When you're out, like if me, you and Andy and Alex are all sitting here and we're like, let's play Star Wars, Star Trek bridge crew right now. We all just press the share play button and suddenly we're all on the bridge and Andy's yelling, torpedoes, torpedoes. And Alex is telling him why that, you know, doesn't make sense in a very data-like voice. It's all done. We're, we just we just need the hardware now. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and I think that... ping, the, Alex. One ping only, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, um, I think that there's, there's probably some room to grow for the Apple TV as far as having both the storage and the horsepower to handle games. And, and also, you know, the current Apple TV has... Uh, you know, has the protocol to be able to do 4K 120. I think frame rate is probably going to come to us before resolution. So, you know, a higher frame rate uh, Apple TV for both games as well as potentially video. You know, Apple has the opportunity to, if they if they wanted to, and we'll see what they do, is to be able to, you can generate the content at 120 with your phone. So your phones, I mean, all of our phones can shoot 120 at least. Um, being able to output that, it's just hard to see it anywhere other than using it for slow motion. Um, so being able to output, you know, output something that we're shooting with our phones, potentially games at 120. And the reason 120 is really important is, is that uh, somewhere in the mid 90 frames per second is when our brain starts to think about it being real. You know, like when I'm just looking at a window as opposed, you know, your brain continues to see the frames, even though you don't really think about them until until you get into the high 90s. And then at that point, it just looks at it like a window um, if you get it right. And so there's a real opportunity for Apple to kind of break some new ground there. Of course, if only they made their own content, they could probably build things like that there. And so if you look at some of the sports that's available down the road, um, you know, if Apple, maybe not next year, but if Apple started building the, the pipeline, they could th theoretically deliver 4K 120 of major league soccer or other things like that that will look dramatically different than what people are used to and and that's just another ad that that would be hard for other companies to use to do without you know because the, everything on every tv that everybody owns is underpowered the tv itself can do 120 <laughs> like if you plug an hdmi 2.1 into it the tv itself can can generate can push out 120 but it doesn't have the processors internally to do it so um it couldn't process that online footage at 120 and, and actually play it out so it gives apple uh, you know it could give a lot of people a lot of reasons to to have an apple tv if they did it well hmm. well i guess we will um I, I'm curious to see what all ends up getting announced with uh, the you know next iteration, and then also uh, the other one I wanted to mention was new AirPods Pro earbuds that are supposed to have uh, support for higher quality audio and uh, the support for or like an updated chip inside that could feature some sort of tracking technology, some health tracking technology. Uh, that remains to be seen, but. Along with that story is one that I saw from 9to5Mac uh, talking about how the AirPods Max beta uh, firmware does introduce a higher quality Bluetooth codec. Uh, this codec is called LC3, the Low Complexity Communication Codec, and by enabling it on your AirPods Max through the beta firmware, uh, then you are able to listen to music through this LC3 codex, but, or excuse me, codec. There are a few companies that are working on as close as they can get to lossless audio using Bluetooth. I just, I'm curious, do a lot of people uh, care about, about uh, lossless audio no, or is that no. just still like, a blue, pretty Bluetooth nerdy isn't thing? Bluetooth lossless. Bluetooth is like a hose right. and you're trying to pump uh, a river through it and it's always going to be a hose and people can't tell the difference anyway. So 
Um, like, I'm, I'm, like people can tell the difference between various levels of it, but once you get to pure lossless and you get to like uh, a wired connection, when you start fiddling with those bit rates, there's no difference. It's just marketing. And Apple was like immune to that marketing for a while and then they went all in on it, which is, I guess, they feel like they have to. But the whole thing just feels very grifty to me. <laughs> Ooh, Not yeah, this codec. This codec is fine. Just the, the, loft, the lossless. Well, just like putting lossless on everything, it feels very grifty to me because you're like, you're, you're targeting um, audiophiles who have more money than hearing and are really happy to spend it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can, I, I have spent the past year sort of trying to settle for myself the question of, hey, does higher quality audio files actually translate? And my, my conclusion after going from uh, MP3 to high quality streaming to, uh, to uh, lossless like CD rips to high resolution audio on consumer level stuff and now like having uh, having a uh, uh, having external DAC and nice head n nice headphones i think that there's a there's a detectable improvement if the if the audio was mastered really really well so if it's an album that was mastered just this year specifically for high resolution audio audio and you have the right hardware yeah you can you can tell the difference but it's not going to be like mind blowing, uh, mind blowing improvement, and for most people, it's going to be fine. What 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 gets lost in the conversation? And again, again, buying buying audio gear based on a histogram that you saw on a website is not going to give you great results. Uh, it's what, what we what gets lost in the conversation is that the engineers who are mastering this stuff they understand that you're probably listening to it through not terribly expensive headphones through whatever chip came into the phone that came with the phone that you bought and it probably is going to come through a streaming service so they're not resigned to failure they will actually tune that mastering so that sounds really really great under those circumstances but the, to answer the question who, uh, who who does this benefit who's this for it really is for companies like apple that are trying to say hey look you use our streaming service because our streaming service is not only lossless it's high definition uh, and hey buy our special bluetooth headphones because our bluetooth with headphones don't make quite a big a mess of the audio as the as the ones that you think sound pretty much just the same at one half the price or replace your replace the headphones you bought from us a year ago because these are much much better yeah i mean i think that i think that the, a lot of the stuff that apple's done with spatial in my opinion is way more interesting than than trying to shave off another three percent of quality um i think but they do if they're going to talk about those things have to be able to at least say that it's really high quality because I think they just get a lot of blowback related to it when they're talking about all these other things that they're doing. I think that they have to, you know, people go, well, it's not as good as am I wired, whatever. Um, and so I think that they, they say that. But I, again, I think that the the stereo to, to spatial processing that Apple does and the actual true Atmos mixes that they're putting out I find to be far more interesting to listen to um, than than you know whether it's a slightly higher quality or not. I do think though that if I I would give up all of those things if I could just have my my AirPods connect to the phone that I have that I'm holding that is sitting yes. in front of me. Like like if you're going to worry if you're going to take engineering time like literally I I'm on a call on a phone that I'm holding, it's probably the one that I want my AirPods to talk to. You know, I'm just, I'm just, you know, just call me crazy. But especially if the, if the, if the thing knows that it's bouncing up and down just a little bit, it's probably the one that I right. want. I want those AirPods on, you know, and, and uh, I, I, since I've never connected it to my, to anything else other than that phone, it'd be, you know, be interesting. So, so I think that Apple, I mean, it's great for us to talk about the little things, but wow, solving that is the big, is yeah. the big thing. And it just doesn't, to me, this is one of those ones where I know it's harder than I think it is because it just seems like, you know, I'm using a certain device for it that would need headphones and I'm holding it and I still can't get it to connect, you know, so. Yeah. No, I'm with you. It's, it's these practical features. Like I have these, so these are my semi audio, this is like bottom of the, bottom of the line audio file grade headphones that cost like 350 yeah. $400. And they, t and they, they do sound great. Like there are on certain recordings or things that I can hear and uh, that I've never been able to hear before without these. But uh, if you chose between these three hundred fifty dollars headphones and the blue, the nice Sony headphones that I have that can maintain connection to multiple devices at once, <laughs> I will. I would much rather have just that feature where when I leave the house, I don't have to necessarily. Oh, what is this connected to now? Do I need to? Do I need to disconnect this and then reconnect this other thing? I mean, that that kind of hassles the reason why I use plugged in plug-in headphones for a lot of stuff because <laughs> it's like whatever is plugged into this visually, that's the headphones you're going to be using it's a very good user interface yeah 
Um, and then the the last little bit of rumor before we take another quick break, uh, AirPods Pro 2, um, uh, they <clears throat> There's a company that, or rather a, a publication that showed off uh, what it believes to be the case design. This is uh, the publication 52 Audio, and that publication happens to have the design of the AirPods 3 uh, and got that accurate. So they've got a little bit of a history of getting things accurate, but when it's only just one other thing, that's not that much. But um, the case design that they show off has the normal charging port on the bottom, looks like a lightning from here, who knows, uh, as well as a hole on the left of the charging port and three holes on the right of the charging port. And then on the side is something interesting that I would love to see come to the AirPods Pro, which is uh, two little holes and kind of a metal eight shaped uh, clip thing where you can slide in a lanyard and be able to add a lanyard directly to your AirPods Pro case. Um, I have a third party case uh, that slides over my AirPods Pro that have that same design on the side so that I can have a little lanyard on it. And uh, I've got these little kind of, they're called ring key and they're just small lanyards that you kind of are meant to just use with a finger. And so I've got one of those attached to my AirPods Pro. But um, the holes on the bottom look like speakers, and that is because this new case is rumored to include Find My Support uh, that is a little bit more in-depth than the current Find My Support. So you can use the Find My app to find your AirPods Pro, the current model, but it doesn't get as... Um, it doesn't get as detailed because it doesn't use, you know, ultra wideband and all of that magic. And it is trying to play audio from the earbuds that are inside of the case. So if the case itself had a speaker on it, then that would make it easier for you to hear where that AirPods Pro case is. So I don't know if this is the real thing. Obviously, none of us do, but I hope it is, at least in the sense that I would love to see the um, speaker on the case so that you can find it if it gets lost. I'm still trying to find one right, of my Jaws AirPod Pro cases. So, yes. I like, <laughs> so I think, I think it's, it's somewhere in the house. I know it's somewhere in this house. There's an AirPod Pro case that I don't know where it is. I, I actually we should we should get together because I know somewhere in the house there is a pair of <laughs> AirPods. I have the case. I just don't know what happened to the AirPods. And I know and I I can absolutely yes. promise you that they're that they're somewhere in the house and I didn't drop them outside. So I'll I'll exactly. send you the case. You said or exactly. <laughs> I was about to say I'll send you the case. You send me the AirPods, but now we're left with the same problem. How about you just now send now me the AirPods ways. first and then I'll Try to send you the case. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, do, we'll, do, we'll do sort of like a shared custody sort of thing. We all we have a half interest each in a, an old pair of AirPods. Yeah, exactly. Renee, what were you going to say? I think, no, I, well, I was going to say Jaws knows, but he's not telling us, um, you mm. know, as is his want. But I, I, I think the rumor is that it's going to be USB C. This will be one of the first products to transition to USB C, which you know, depending on depending on how you feel about that, could be fantastic news for you or you could be just throwing all your lightning cables up in the air and saying why are you doing this to me again i just got over 30 pin so we'll see how that goes <laughs> but it sounds like they're going to be really really good products yeah i i hope it's USB-C. that'll make me happy um yeah. all right let's take a quick break so we can hear from leo about uh new tech's tricaster pro if you're watching our shows, hello everybody, let me, Leo Laporte here. I just want to interrupt briefly to mention how we do what we do from day one, 2008, when we first started doing video, I was looking for an affordable solution that let me do broadcast quality video. I remember at Tech TV, we spent a million dollars, a million dollars just in the switcher alone. So I was really thrilled to find the new tech TriCaster and we've been TriCasters ever since. We love the TriCaster. The new TriCaster 2 Elite, oh, amazing. It's the most complete live production system on the planet. Uh, I mean, we've come such a long way since 2008. A lot of new features. There's a full line of TriCasters, though, and, and the TriCaster 2 Elite may not be right for you, but what's nice is you can go to the website. We've got a special place you can go, and it will walk you through an interactive guide that'll help you decide which TriCaster is right for you. Go.newtech.com slash twit-tv. Go there and go through the interactive thing. But let me tell you, 
about the top of the line because this is so sweet. The TriCaster 2 Elite, that's what we're using here at Twit. More than a live production uh, video production system, it's an all encompassing digital media solution. And if you are creating content for the internet, for mobile, for television, this is the way to go. Uh, so many broadcasters now are using TriCaster because it's broadcast quality at a much lower price. I think if we were starting to do tech TV today, we'd probably be all TriCaster. Late in 2021, uh, New Tech unleashed an updated version of the TriCaster 2 Elite, bringing in a host of new and exciting features. The much-loved Live Call Connect feature now supports so many more platforms. Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, FaceTime as inputs to any production, which is great because people have different ways of connecting. You want to make sure that you go to them and work with them. Plus, selectable audio and video return now enables TriCaster 2 Elite operators to view an audio return like any other output allowing greater flexibility. The new Neural Voice Isolation tool cleans up audio. It uses AI to cancel or reduce background noise, automatically detect voices, maintains all important production quality, and so much power. John is the macro master. We've got incredible macros on our TriCaster, variable support now, a dynamic and powerful tool that allows operators to nest macros, so if you've got a complex production and you, and you want repeatability, a macro is such a great way to do it. You can encode three channels in anything from HD to UHD at the same time. That's amazing. There's so much power in this thing. And they brought the live panel builder. If you've used TriCaster, you're probably familiar with that. They brought the live panel builder into the TriCaster so you can create bespoke user interfaces, customize the presets with the user interface. That's a boon because I am running the TriCaster. I don't know what the hell I'm doing anymore. So they can set it up for me to make it very simple and easy for me to use without compromising on quality. I love it. And quality and creativity are so important with, with new tech. Operators could see the resolution and frame rate of every video source coming into their TriCaster. So you always know we're getting what quality we're getting. There's an NDI Genlock tool. If you do video production, you know that's a big deal. TriCaster 2 Elite users can now match outputs to a common sync pulse. So you, you get frame accurate everywhere. Perfect for remote workflows. You can send alpha channel through one of the mix outs. You can bring post-production closer to live. Users can use keying on a TriCaster to feed graphics or real-time 3D creation tools. Really, the sky's the limit. I, when did we get our TriCaster 2? Pretty Fairly recently. We, we, we upgraded recently. The TriCaster 2 arrived in 2020. I think we got it shortly after. It's an incredibly powerful live production system. And these... New updates put even more power into the hands of storytellers everywhere. I, you could tell I'm a fan. TriCaster 2 Elite. It's transformative. It's setting new standards. It is literally better than broadcast. But as I said, there's a whole range of TriCasters, including the TriCaster 1 Pro, which is a fantastic evolution of modern storytelling for producers, content creators, and publishers. Future-ready capabilities, streamlined, uh, streamlined live video production, live call connect is in there. Yes, 4K UHD switching. Yes, man, if if they had showed me this in 2008, I would have said no. You can't do that for less than a million bucks. You can live streaming recording. It's incredible. Explore the latest in the TriCaster family. All you have to do is go to the webpage. I told it to you before. Let me tell you again. Go.newtech.com slash twit dash TV. Use that guide. It'll tell you based on what your needs are, which TriCaster is right for you. I know we all want the TriCaster 2 Elite, <laughs> but you don't. maybe you don't have all the need for all of those incredible features. They'll help you choose the one that you need that's right for you. Go. Dot Newtech, N E W T E K dot com slash twit dash T V. This is the way. The way. And twit wouldn't exist without it. Thank you, Newtech. Geo dot Newtech dot com slash twit dash T V. Now, back to Mac Break Weekly. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Leo, and thank you, New Tech. All right, let us get back into the show. I've got a boop, 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 breaking news topic as we join Andy Anatko, Renee Ritchie, and Alex Lindsay. Uh, folks, Niantic is out with a new game, and this time 
Pokemon Go is yesterday because NBA is where it's at. Uh, Renee, you soon will be nope, collecting nope. NBA nope. basketball stars. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Ryan Reynolds is not the only Canadian who can just sit there going, nope, 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 nope. nope. So, okay, I'll tell you, NBA is, All World I just, is, is. I just, I just heard that a new Larry Bird spawned behind the behind the the deli on Thirty First Street. <laughs> oh, he's mega evolving. Got to catch this all is the basically Celtics. Pokemon Go reskinned. Um, the, a lot of the same uh, sort of methods of collecting new things, of taking on other people, and it's uh, it's a, f- a free to play game. So you'll be able to download it for free and play it. You collect NBA stars. This is from Polygon. Buff and customize them with items picked up from visits to real world locations, and take on other players in one on one matches at their neighborhood courts. So. I think this is an interesting choice because Pokemon has a a very specific following and, uh, you know, I would say a very happy fan base. It's it's relatively wide. You know, you've got a lot of people uh, from all different walks of life who are into Pokemon. Um, NBA is more of a uh, a, 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 like pop culture kind of thing that that is, is known by a lot of folks, but... I'm curious about kind of the overlap between the two. I don't I know if a, a lot of people though, who are... Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So like, so I think what most people misunderstand about Niantic is that they are not a gaming company. They are the Skyhook company that Google acquired that had a little bit of trouble with some Wi-Fi router mapping, you know, brouhaha's and <laughs> Google, you know, you know, gushy them off to, to a, an internal startup. They span out. They were the Google Maps team. They were the Google Earth team. Brilliant people. But they're mappers. And Pokemon Go was a thin franchise veneer over their desire to crowdsource walking and AR maps. And they've never, like people forget that. People complain about the game direction. They're leaving all this money on the table by not letting us play from home. It's because they have way more money to make out of getting you out there and walking and mapping the world for them. So everything that they do has to be looked through the lens of data acquisition, uh, mapping, AR technology. And a lot of their games have failed, like the Harry Potter game famously failed. They tried a couple of their own sort of properties, haven't done well. So I think it makes sense for them to explore another franchise. I just don't know, like with Pokemon Go, it's super simple. Everyone's out there walking. You have to have location on all the time to hatch your stupid eggs. And then you like, and if you want bonuses, you have to take out your camera and walk around an area and film it for them. That gets uploaded and they have literal like, Alex Lindsay style photo uh, videogrammetry of every location on earth eventually. So the NBA thing, I'm just not sure yet what, what, how that adds to their, their mission to map the world. That's, that's my only concern. Oh, so you're kind of curious about what's the deal here. <laughs> if it's the not why, about not the what, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, why are they coming out with this? Because you think it's not just the way that they want to make money. This is actually, you, you feel that there's something Underlying the way they this. want to make okay. more money. There's way more money in, in, in what they're building than what they're what they're developing. If that makes I sense. mean, so what I was saying before um, before you you were asking your question is that the Venn diagram I think doesn't have a huge overlap in terms of uh, Pokemon Go and NBA. I'm sure there's some overlap, but I don't think it's a huge overlap. And so, what is better than captivating this audience to go out and walk, but then also taking that right side of the Venn diagram and getting them out and mapping the world. So it's just an extension, I think, of of more bodies out there doing their thing, mapping the world, uh, as as you know, you're kind of you're kind of pointing to as the the reason behind everything. Yeah, I mean I, I mean I think that the, the driving reason is is that the NBA still wants to be part of the cool kids and figure out what what they can do next and even if it's an experiment. Um, I mean they, they have a very strong market. Uh, from the NBA, but you're always going to look at, you know, where an eSport, I mean, all these NBA locations have their own eSports teams. They have their own, they're paying attention to NFTs and they're paying attention to all the things that are next, like how do they capitalize on those? And so some of these things are kind of experiments and someone has a good presentation and they're like, yeah, let's do that. So the NBA wants to stay on that front edge. And I'm sure that Niantic wants to keep on trying to expand, taking something they already know how to do and push it in. So it's a convenience of both sides that are looking for one is trying to expand its market. The other one's trying to stay on the edge. That's probably how the deal got done. Um, whether to to what your point is and what Renee's, whether the consumers really want that or not is up in the air. But they're going to keep on throwing things against the wall because they don't want to miss out on either side. 
Yeah. They, they already sense. have a really, they already have a really really big hit game AAA game uh, that's amazing. Not just for its gameplay, not just for how well it looks, but also for the amount of like marketing integration in it. Like there's there's an actual like before before you make it to the bigs, there's like a Gatorade sponsored league. <laughs> and there's like logos everywhere and that's that's a lot a lot of free money and people like free money that's why they call it money <laughs> <laughs> and why they call it free um all right next i wanted to mention this story because leo dropped it into his uh pins those are the links that he likes to talk about on given episodes of macbreak weekly so it seemed like he was pretty excited about this one um you may have seen the tweet going around about uh the apple newton message pad making a cameo in uh, for all mankind on apple tv plus and one of the show's producers tweeted about how they made the prop uh, to work for all mankind. And it says, uh, Ben McGinnis is, is one of the producers. It says tech advances faster in 1990s for all mankind, alt history. All us Apple nerds had a blast creating and playing with our modified Newton's removable camera and video calls. Props even fit an iPhone 12 pro max inside the Newton point of view angles in the show were shot on iPhone. So as they were doing those calls between the actors, they were actually using an iPhone 12 Pro Max as the camera uh, to be able to show that footage on screen whenever they had those those moments where the, the actors were talking to one another. So it is. this is where I am asking you folks as uh, Apple historians a little bit here. Is Am I to understand that there was not actually a camera connector for the Newton that exists in our universe. And so they made a universe in which there was a camera connection for the Newton. There was no camera for the Newton message pad. That's all. That's also, I thought it was also interesting because that was even like a message pad 100, was it? Or yeah, it looks like a, I think it's a 100. So it was, it was basically the very, very first Newton. To, uh, oddly enough, it looks like they ripped off the design from the Palm Trio because the Trio had a, <laughs> had a snap-in camera, a lot of that. The, uh, the, uh, the uh, Game Boy camera also had a snap-in camera that looked a lot yes, like that. Yes, I remember um, that I, one. Yeah, what, what what I got what I wonder though is did they go all the way? Did they actually contact like Frog Design? Like, did, did they go to like the 1990s oh like Apple designers to say we imagine you've been you, we 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 need it we need a Apple Apple is not going to build it yet, but they want to see what it looks like. Draw us, give us a rendering of what it would look like. That would have been absolutely top of the class. Hmm. Now, now I'm curious about that. Hopefully we see some more. I like that, you know, uh, Ben just posted this on Twitter and talked about the process a little bit. Uh, these kind of inside looks at things are a lot of fun yeah. and uh, give us an insight into how the these production companies are, are working on the, the films. Um, yeah. All right. I think with that, we can. Oh, I'll briefly mention uh, we have to do a little celebratory dance in our hearts and perhaps in our chairs because iWork got an update recently. Uh, for folks who don't know, that is Apple's suite of productivity uh, software, Pages, Numbers, and Keynote. And Pages now features Mail Merge. Mail Merge is back. <laughs> so Dan if Warren you... Yes, Dan Warren was incredibly happy. Uh, my pal Rosemary Orchard uh, from iOS Today this morning, also very happy. Um, if you have ever done automated um, filling out of forms and you've had to find different ways of doing that, well, Mail Merge is back and can help you get that figured out. They kind of show it as a way if you have uh, perhaps your child is graduating from high school and they want to send out little graduation announcements to people. It could take a really long time to pop in all of that information or find some online platform that will let you do an upload of your contacts, which then results in a privacy concern of maybe they use your contacts for other things. So now that can all be built into Mail Merge. It can happen automatically. And Rosemary was telling me this morning that she likes to use Mail Merge, not for contact reasons, uh, but to create, very easily create like a calendar um, book. So she was able to have it automatically populate dates for a given year and create a whole kind of document full of, of calendar days and uh, weeks and months and all of that kind of stuff. So a pretty cool uh, re-addition to the platform. And um, 
Some updates in numbers for mostly performance things there, uh, adding cells and uh, columns to spreadsheets that are huge. Now doesn't take a long time. It used to kind of chug along. Um, And in Keynote, uh, there are now dynamic backgrounds. So you can create a Keynote presentation that just has a nice subtle bit of movement in the background. And Apple gives you the ability to kind of change that general generative animation exactly how you want it. So you can sort of ramp up the speed or how often the waves, the amplitude, all that kind of stuff um, in order to create something that's just kind of visually pleasing that's going on in the background while your uh, presentation is going on. So um, I, I wonder, are you excited about that? Alex, I know you love Keynote. Yeah, I mean, it looks, they all look good. I mean, there's nothing there that's groundbreaking. Um, but the dynamic one, one of the things that I wanted to test that I just haven't had got, it's been a busy week, so I haven't got it tested yet, is whether those dynamic ba- backgrounds reset between slides. Um, someone had told, told me that they don't, so that, you know, that the slide remains normal if you as you go from one to the next, but I'm not oh, 100% neat. certain of that yet. So, that um, is so cool. We, that's something we want to test uh, related to that. So the it, it is a nice little ad. I will say that it, if, for those of us presenting mostly over Zoom or other things like that, subtle movement is really hard on compression. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like the worst. It's kind of the worst thing ever, you know. So, so I, I, I think I probably won't use it that often, uh, mostly because again, it, it puts an enormous amount of pressure on a on a low latency video connection like the one we're using for the show. Definitely, that makes sense. All right, gents, it is time for your picks of the week. And I think we will start with Alex because I have been waiting to learn what the heck this is. <laughs> so so I, I, my, my pick for the week is called Crayon. It's not spelled the way you'd normally spell it. It's C-R-A-I, A-I being the important part here, uh, Y-O-N uh, dot com. So Crayon is an A-I. It's basically like a little mini Dolly. In fact, it used to be Dolly Mini. <laughs> so now it's... It, is it as good as Dolly 2? No. Is it fun? Yes. <laughs> so, so what you do is you type in a word or type in a phrase. And I, so I typed in like I, while we were doing the show, just to, to see what happened, I typed in stone statue of twit warrior. So this is our warrior who will protect us. Um, and here's what we got. So, so I think I, I personally like I personally like this guy down here. He's like, he's, he's there to protect you, but he's also there to party, you know? And so, you know, he's, he's having a good time. Um, you know, this guy looks pretty serious. Uh, anyway, but it, the, the key with these images is that I just typed in that, this is what I want to see. And it made those images like from scratch. It just went, Oh, I'm going to go. F-, and it, it just, yeah. it, you know, if I, and so it's, it's a really fascinating thing. I think I, I'm finding it to be, um, fun you know to to play yeah. with uh, what what ai will uh, come up and and so I, I since i saw it i've been kind of i have it opened and if i'm working on something i just go oh something pops into my head i i wonder what it would do with that and i put it in it takes a couple minutes for it to to produce something and, and then i go back to whatever i'm doing and this fun little <laughs> treat pops up of something and some of them work and some of them don't i mean it's not like they're they're all uh, works of art. In fact, none of, none of them are. They're, they're, I will say that Dolly 2 makes, I don't have access to it, yeah. but I've seen a bunch of the stuff from Dolly 2, makes much more uh, realistic views of things. But it's really interesting. And I, I find it interesting to brainstorm with it. Like, you know, what will it do when I say this? And it pops up something, oh, I got an idea for something like that. And so so I think it's, it's pretty interesting. I also think it's important for people to understand how AI is working, because mm-hmm. I think that it's it's important for us to get our head around it, because uh, we we're moving very quickly towards a reality where you should not look at anything and think that it was the truth. Like you know, like there's no video, no audio, no image that you should just assume without um, a couple other uh, pieces of data is is something that you're that you're actually looking at. So I think it's important for people to educate themselves so that they can still be um, useful in this society and not panicked all the time by seeing things that aren't real. We had the two lead engineers from Dolly 2 on Tech News Weekly back whenever they first did the rollout and announcement of it. Um, and I hinted a few times about how I was on the wait list and would love to be invited. But I'm still is, waiting on my invite. That, I have a lot of friends that are very close to, uh, you know, all kinds of things that are related to that. That wait list is super deep and really almost made of unatanium. Like it's, you know, the, the, the fear that they have right now is they're trying to figure out what works and what and, and how how to build regulatory structures. And I think that they don't want to um, have anybody put something up that scares people. So it's, it's already limited. Absolutely. And they, 
they want kind of some filters over, you know, what might end up out there because they're, they're still trying to figure it out. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, I typed in Chihuahua Lego and I am posting in the link uh, underneath the crayon link uh, if somebody wants to pull that up on the uh, TriCaster. And I am delighted by what the, the system <laughs> has come up with. There's some very blocky chihuahuas there. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. <laughs> that's great. So <laughs> you, can see, you can see how you could look at it and it could be just kind of a fun, uh, <laughs> like the two-headed Chihuahua. Yeah, the two-headed chihuahua. chihuahua. <laughs> yeah, so. It's just fun. Yeah, I, and the idea from a that brainstorming you perspective, I, I do think it's a really fun thing to brainstorm. You know, like oh, mm -hmm. I, you know, to get something that just is completely different than what you expected. Yeah, inspire inspiration there, and the thought of typing something in, walking away, and coming back to that tab later, and you're just like, oh, that's fun. That's that's mm -hmm. what I'm going to do. I have to type in some other things. Uh, so that's a crayon.com with an AI uh, there in the middle. That's clever. Um, Andy, why don't you tell us about your pick of the week? My pick of the week is an update to an old favorite. Uh, uh, I know that one out of every eight things I recommend are like notes apps and lists apps <laughs> and things like that because I, I, I am a sucker for every new one that comes along because as much as I like the one I'm using now, I'm always looking for the better one uh, because capturing ideas, capturing notes whenever, wherever, and getting them back really efficiently is a very, very big deal for me. Uh, but one of my f enduring favorites has been an app by the Icon Factory called Tot, T-O-T, uh, because it is so simple. Like I, I have notes apps like Evernote that I like because they are so muscular. You could, I could, I could produce an entire column, an entire radio show, whatever, just with the tools inside uh, inside Evernote. But the thing is, so much of the time, all I want to do is I'm on a phone, uh, I'm on a, a Zoom call or something, and I just need something to take a quick note in, or there's something that I just want to capture right now. Sometimes when I'm podcasting, like I I certainly can't remember the names of like th three or four people that I'm on the show f uh, show with. I mean, you, Sam, Tom, and Elliot are, are an exception because we've been doing the show for like 800 episodes. But like I need to, oh, go, oh during the introductions, I'll like type down the names so I can say, yeah, I think that Elliot made a really, really good point there. And I'd like to, you know, uh, so uh, it, what I like about it is that it's a very, very simple, uh, simple uh, capture note taker that you can access through the, uh, it's, it's an iOS app and it's a Mac app. The Mac app is free. Uh, the iOS app is 20 bucks, but that's 20 bucks forever and you own it. Uh, and there's, there's iCloud syncing between the two apps and all of your Mac instances of this app instantly. Uh, what I love about it is that, again, it's not a free form like uh, productivity uh, personal information uh, a solution it is simply a like a notepad with just eight pages on it with like colored tabs on it so you can sort of associate one tab with uh, with one thing that you're doing uh, it's accessible from the menu bar uh, and you can either tap on the menu bar and it'll drop down and then it'll pop right back up again or you can tear it off and now it's now it's a floater uh, the uh, it does have uh, the only things that it has regarding feature features is that it supports limited markdown. So if you are sick and tired of remembering command B for bold, command I for italic, and you'd much rather go underscore me underscore, uh, it will support markdown. Uh, it does support simple uh, style text. The other thing is the thing that they just added, which is the, uh, the ability to do bulleted lists, which is I'll, I, I will support this. I will endorse this. I just want to make sure that Icon Factory does not turn this into something super complicated because the, the what makes this so great is that it is so simple. That's the reason why I have been using it for years, whereas so many other note-taking apps have just come and gone after I uh, got after I got used to them. Uh, but it's very it's it's simple enough to do uh, either either a formatted bullet list or even just a checkbox. Here is a list of things that need to be like actioned on. And given that it's something that you can sync between multiple Macs and uh, sync between your Macs and your iPhone. Okay, that's I will allow that. That's a useful feature. Uh, but uh, and on top of everything else, it is an Icon Factory app, and they are one of the Marines, one of the superheroes of Mac app design, where they just so intrinsically understand the soul and the spirit of what a Mac uh, app or what an iOS app should look like and behave like. Uh, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful little thing, not more complicated than it needs to be visually. but And yet every feature that you want is exactly where you expect it to be. So I'm very, very happy with it. It's, it is on that list of like a handful of apps that every time I'm setting up a brand new machine, 
instantly gets activated, instantly gets updated because I'm definitely not doing without this app if it's something that, if it's a machine that I need to actually do work with. Nice. Uh, yeah, I have uh, taught on my Mac and I, I swear by it too. I think it's a fantastic yeah. uh, app to use for exactly what you're talking about. I uh, used to just have a text edit document open every day with right. just plain text. And that was where I just jotted things down and then Tot came along and it made sense to do it there instead because it keeps things unformatted and that's what right. I want is just plain text. And, um, and, 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 okay. and, it never, and it never prevents you from restarting by saying, oh, you, have, you have 11 open documents. Would you like to review each and every one of them and save them? <laughs> it's like, no, just it, Tot will just save as you go. You, you can, for, for, for worry warts, it will actually res resort to a command S, but you basically, it just knows that if you, if you type a character, that character is saved and synced. Again, so simple. Simple, simple. And that is what makes it awesome. All right. Last but not least is Renee's pick of the week. Tell us what you got for us, Renee. You you can say least, Mike. I will not blame you. I will not hold you <laughs> to any judgment if you say least. So mine is something I actually just ordered. It's the Moment Anamorphic Adapter. Uh, and it does have some downsides. Um, you know, like I believe it's cropped, but it allows you to take almost any lens. You just put on the right ring adapter, slap this on the, it goes on the, on the, outside of the lens, like you would put like an ND filter or like, a, you know, one of the Hollywood filters, like a, I'm using a smoke filter now, but like any sort of uh, filter that you want to use, you put it on the end and it gives you like the squish of an anamorphic lens, not anything, the quality that Alex would produce, you know, with his, with his <laughs> anam an anamorphic special effects uh, genius. But for people like me who just want to look like a little bit like a J.J. Abrams set, you know, just have a few flares here and there, you know, so I can so I can look like I am you know, shooting in location in space. Um, I've tried various things to sort of get that effect, and I haven't. And this is a, I forget, it's like a one-third compression, I believe. So it still gives you a lot of good resolution. And if you've been shooting with, like, not with your iPhone, obviously, but if you've been shooting with, like, a camera, you know, any Sony, Canon, uh, anything like that, I think it's it's... It's great fun, and if you get... I'm not sure if the early bird is still available. The first one was sold out immediately. Like, I clicked the link as soon as they announced it, and then the, the early, early bird was gone. But I think they have quite a few deals left, and I love, I love supporting the company, so it looks like a lot of fun. Awesome. Yes, uh, that is one that I think a lot of people are going to hop on for sure. All right, folks, with that, we have reached the end of this episode of Mac Break Weekly. Uh, that means it's time to go around and talk to our fellow panelists here and see what they're up to, where they can go, uh, where we all can go to find them online. Let's start with Andy and Notco over on WGBH. Uh, where should folks go to find your work and uh, listen to you on the radio. Uh, I'm going to be on the radio this week one day early. I'm on uh, Thursday at 1230 in the afternoon. You can go to WGBH news.org to stream it live or later uh, I will we are broadcasting from the Boston Public Library studios on that Thursday I will most likely be there unless I oversleep and miss my train into the city in which case I will be uh, streaming via zoom at home but I plan to be there so come in hang out grab a cup of coffee in the cafe uh, and watch me pretend that I'm not reading from notes even though I'm totally reading from notes <laughs> <laughs> that's just the insider information that you get here that's the, that's, that's the beauty when you're not streaming video I don't have to maintain eye contact while while I nervously like well if I re if I recall I think that the, that was in 2011 <laughs> that senators Warren and Kolachek <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's uh, you may have caught me doing that a few times. My memory, uh, is, my memory is off to camera left, as you understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's where I keep it. Um, <laughs> Renee Ritchie of youtube.com slash Renee Ritchie. Uh, what videos have you recently published or do you have coming up for us? I just I just just put up uh, CarPlay uh, sort of a lot of the details behind the new version of CarPlay and why I think that it's going to be transformative and what and the car deal, the car manufacturers are just going to fall in line be behind the experience especially given that whopping amounts of of new car buyers in the US use iPhones the vast vast majority of them and like 79% or something it's going to be really interesting and I'm trying YouTube shorts Mike don't judge me they're TikToky oh. they're really um, but I did one that explains the difference between pass keys and passwords, and one that explained the difference between single core and multi core. Just like little explainers with animated uh, emoji, which I just, it turns out I love animating emoji. Who knew? 
Okay, I can't. I'm going to watch that for sure then. If there okay. are animated emoji yes. in it, that'll be fun. There are. Uh, uh, good, good. Now we know. YouTube.com slash Renee Ritchie. Head there. And then last but not least, 090.media and officehours.global. It's Alex Lindsay. What's uh, coming up on Office Hours or anything else you want to share? We had a great one today, actually. Uh, Office Hours has its own band. I mean, you know, you know you're know, you at a certain level when you have your own band. We have a band called, we call the remotes because they've never actually worked with each other, oh, worked with each other in person. <laughs> And they um, and they built a new. They have a new song. We just did it this morning. So we they they came on. They played the song for us, and uh, one of the members wrote it. Another one arranged it, and then a whole bunch of other folks recorded all their parts. And then it went back to another person who who um, finished it. Who then handed it off to other people to continue to do. It's it's quite a thing. So the the first thing to do is just listen to the song and watch it, which is a great barbecue song. Like it's a good kind of background, having a good time over the summer kind of song. And then, but they really start breaking down like all the things that they did to put it together. And it's really amazing. I mean, this is like the third song I think that they've put out so far. And they've got a couple more in the hopper right now. And they, they slowly put them out. I mean, the last one was like a year ago. So it's, it's not like they're <laughs> highly pro prolific because everyone's a busy artist that's that, or busy, you know, doing what they're doing on their day job. But they slowly put the, together these very, very interesting pieces. And then they explain all the little idiosyncrasies. One of the things I learned today from our warning session was we were talking about um, someone took some some uh, MIDI and then put it into what they were doing in Digital Composer. And then one of the other folks said, well, it was so good, you know, that I really liked the MIDI. We normally you hate it. And uh, he was and what what the secret was, he played it into it. He said it has all the human to it. Oh. Mid, the problem with MIDI is that it sounds very mechanical. And if you play it in and have it not hit perfectly, hit very close, but not perfectly, it, it sounds much more melodic and, and it feels much more. And I just hadn't ever thought of that before. And so, and there's a whole, that's just like one of many things that, uh, that, that I thought were real, was really interesting. And so, uh, it's a great hour that we just did this morning. And you can you can see it at Office Hours Global on YouTube. Just That's the channel's Office Hours Global. You can, of course, see all the stuff that we're doing at officehours.global is the website. And um, it's just a lot of fun every day. We have a, a big update. Zoom just did a big update with Rooms. And we actually have some of the engineering staff from Zoom <laughs> coming on to talk about it tomorrow. Oh, so, nice. So, it's, so it goes from, you know, making music to uh, folks that are really making the software that we use every day. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So I would definitely check it out. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, definitely going to be checking that one out for sure. Officehours.global. Um, and now it's time to say thank you, uh, gents for joining me today and, uh, appreciate, uh, stepping in here for Leo today and hanging out with you. Uh, it is time to get back to work because break time is over. Goodbye. Hey, I'm Rod Pyle, editor of Ad Astra Magazine, and each week I'm joined by Tarek Malik, the editor-in-chief over at Space.com, in our new This Week in Space podcast. Every Friday, Tarek and I take a deep dive into the stories that define the new space age. What's NASA up to? When will Americans once again set foot on the moon? And how about those samples from the Perseverance rover? When are those coming home? What the heck has Elon Musk done now? In addition to all the latest and greatest in space exploration, we'll take an occasional look at bits of spaceflight history that you probably never heard of, and all with an eye towards having a good time along the way. Check us out on your favorite podcatcher. 